Well, good morning, everyone. And I uh, don't know about you, but I'm amazed that we've reached the point where someone like me has to get up here and present the message. So, and with that, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, you know what a flawed vessel I am. And uh, I just pray that you would bless me to present your word and your truth. And Holy Spirit, as always, we pray that you'd be working amongst us to receive that word and that truth. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the, the, the passage today was from Hebrews 10. We're going to look at a couple of verses there. Go to Hebrews 10, verse 23. As you're turning here, I was just telling my wife, Barbara, there, there's just something different. I teach Sunday school quite often, but there is just a different aura when you are presenting the sermon. So, so bear with me if I stumble here and there. So Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 23. And the word says, let us hold fast confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we're going to look at these last two verses here, and we're going to look at them from the end to the beginning. We're going to look at them backwards. So this day that he mentions here, what are we talking about? As we see the day approaching. Well, some commentators think, well, well, this is to Hebrews, and so the author was just telling them, oh, the, 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 the end of Jerusalem is coming, the Romans are coming, that's the day that they're referring to. I disagree with those commentators, and, and many more commentators, and I as well believe that the day that the author is talking about here is the day of the Lord. And so what is this day of the Lord? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13, starting in verse 6. And it doesn't start off very well. Well, for the day of the Lord is at hand. He will come, it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened, and it's going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. I says the Lord, will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And there's other passages that talk about this day of the Lord, but what the day of the Lord is, it's not a 24-hour period. It's a figure of speech. A day means a period of time, and specifically the day of the Lord is when the God finally, after you know, millennia of patience, pours out his wrath upon the earth. So this is the day of the Lord. It doesn't sound like a very happy time. Fortunately for we in the church, the day of the Lord is preceded by the day of Christ. As you see from the picture up here, that's what I chose to represent. The day of Christ, when he comes for his church before God pours out his wrath. So, so the author in Hebrews is saying, as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Well, how can we see this day approaching? Is it a, is it a secret? Is it well known? Well, let's go to 1 Thessalonians and see what Paul has to say about it. Because I've heard tell that it comes like a thief in the night and no one will know. Let 
First Thessalonians chapter five. So here Paul says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, so he's talking to believers here. He's not talking to the masses. He's talking to believers. You have no need that I should write to you. See, Paul says, I don't need to tell you about the signs and the seasons because you already know. You have the scriptures already, so you, you can discern the times. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Well, now he's saying, well, it comes as a thief in the night. How, how are you going to see the day approaching if he comes as a, as a thief, if it's sneaky? For when they say, okay, he's talking to the brethren. Now he's referring to they. The they here are the unbelieving world, the, the, the wicked, the sinners that the day of the Lord is appointed for. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And as we saw back in the previous passage, what they're not going to escape is awful and terrible, and it's God's judgment upon the wicked. But, Paul likes to use that word a lot, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. So that this day should overtake you as a thief. So Paul says, the world is in darkness. The world is not going to know. The, the world is going to be surprised as a, like a thief in the night. But you, brethren, you shouldn't be surprised. And as the author of Hebrews says, we should be able to see this day approaching. Now, a wise man in this congregation once gifted me with an analogy of of things to come, and I think he got it from someone else, but, and I'm, I'm going to plagiarize him here. He likened it to, you're, you're driving across, let's say, the plains of Colorado, and off in the distance, you see, just see a smudge on the horizon. You know, that's, that's the mighty Rocky Mountains, but they're just a smudge on the horizon. Are you there yet? No, you've got a whole day of driving ahead of you before you get there, but the closer you get to those mountains, the bigger and now you can start discerning individual peaks. You can, oh, that's got snow on it. That's got trees on it over there. The closer you get, the more defined the mountains become. So you can see them approaching. You're not there yet, but you know you're going to be in the mountains soon. And that's what I liken the scriptures to us. We're, we're, we're presented this, this scene as we're approaching, and we're going to look at some signposts that God is... He's flashing the knee on it, if you're paying attention, that we are just about in the mountains. That day is approaching. The day is almost here. And before I get too far involved, I, I'm making this presentation rapture timing neutral, right? Whether you are a pre-tribulation believer, a mid-tribulation, Pre-wrath, well, okay, post-tribulation, no, you, you, you're just wrong. Uh, uh, okay, you're just wrong if you're post-tribulation. But, but these other ideas of when the rapture happens, what I'm presenting is applicable to all of those. So, so I think wherever you come, as far as your belief of when the rapture is, this is going to apply to you. So what are some of the signs that we see that the day, the day of the Lord is approaching? Well, Paul gives us some indicators. Go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. And now Paul's going to tell us what society and the world is going to be like in the last days. And now some people say, oh, but it's always been like that. Well, then why didn't Paul just say, well, in the last days, things would be pretty much the way they are. He doesn't say that. So the things he's describing here, yes, they've always existed in some form or another, but they're going to wax much greater as we get closer to those mountains, as we see that day approaching. So there in chapter 3 in 2 Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. We don't see any of that, do we? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving. And here's the big one. You, you turn on the news and watch any political talking head. Unforgiving. The, the hatred is palpable in the world today. 
slanderers, speaking of politicians, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And, then, and here is the, the truly frightening one, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people, turn away. So the, even the churches are full of, I call them nominal Christians, Christians in name only. And they, 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 they might say, oh yes, I believe in a Jesus, but they deny the power of that name and what that means. So here Paul is saying, in the last days, society is going to go down the toilet. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I've lived over half a century now. Things are worse than when I was young. We got some people that are a little bit older than me. They can probably vouch as well. Things are not normal. Things are not the way they used to be. Things are waxing worse. And just like Paul tells us, in the last days, society is just going to get worse and worse and worse. So that's, I call that just a, a general sign, right? We have some more specific indicators. It's been in the news a lot here lately. The nation of Israel. Go to Isaiah chapter 66. See, because without Israel, you know, nothing else matters. Israel is God's timepiece. Israel is the center of everything in the end times. So if Israel doesn't exist, then... We're, we're still in Nebraska. <clears throat> Isaiah 66. Starting in verse 7. Before she is in labor, she gives birth. So even before the labor pains on... The baby's there. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. So this is talking about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Up until May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel had not existed for over 2,900 years. In the time when the northern tribes were scattered, that was the end of the nation of Israel. 2,900 years, no nation of Israel. Judah still existed, but it's, it's not Israel. It's just a, 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 a fragment. But the nation of Israel has not existed for almost 3,000 years. Then, in 1948, May 14th, three things happened. The Jews declared their independence. The United Nations... issued a statement that the, the British had to relinquish Palestine and give that land to Israel, and the United States recognized the nation of Israel, all in that same 24-hour period. These three, three things happened. Israel declared independence, Britain gave up Palestine, and the United States recognized, and along with other countries, that Israel was a nation. So literally, in a single day, the nation was reborn. And so that should be a major signpost for anyone that, okay, God's major playing piece is on the board now. Jerusalem, Israel is here. Of course, when Israel was formed, Jerusalem wasn't in play because it was still owned by the Arabs. But later on in 1967, God took care of that. And now Israel also has Jerusalem, which is going to be our next signpost. Go to Zechariah chapter 12. You're just in Zechariah for Sunday school. Zechariah 12. And once again, you cannot turn on any news station today and not have this city of Jerusalem mentioned. And, and, and the latest unpleasantness between the Palestinians and Israel was started because of what was going on in Jerusalem, friction between the Palestinians and the Jews over the, the holy sites. And that's what prompted Hamas to start launching their missiles at Israel and Israel to retaliate. So what does the Bible say about all of this? Zechariah chapter 12, starting in verse 1. 
the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, he stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. So he's the guy in charge, right? He's in control. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. When they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Isn't it ironic, you, especially again from a non-believer's point of view, is you have this country the size of Delaware out, out in the desert, right? It's not strategically located. There's no strategic waterways near there or or strategic resources that the world wants as far as natural resources. It's just little country, got this ancient city there, and yet the entire world is obsessed, obsessed to seething hatred with what goes on in that patch of desert. Well, it's not desert anymore since the Jews are there. They, they've, they've been making a blossom. But once again, geopolitically, it should be totally insignificant. Who cares what happens in Israel and Jerusalem? What does it matter? But God says it's going to matter greatly because the world is going to be obsessed with Jerusalem because Jerusalem is God's city. It's not, just, it's not Israel's city. It's God's city. But there's some interesting things going on regarding Jerusalem and it becoming a burden for those nations around it. On October 4th, 2020, Recep Erdogan, he's the... the uh, dictator, the president, whatever you want to call him, of Turkey. He declared that Jerusalem is our city, meaning the Muslims' city. So Erdogan says Jerusalem is ours. And so for him, the Israelis are occupiers and interlopers. They have no right to be there. And then here just recently, May 13th of this year, and I'm going to quote here from the news article, Turkey's recent Tayyip Erdogan wants Israel to be taught a deterrent lesson as the Jewish state responds to attacks from militant Palestinian groups at its borders. I don't think the story is biased at all. The Turkish strongman, is what he calls him, told Russian President Vladimir Putin that he wanted the international community to give Israel a strong and deterrent lesson, adding that the UN Security Council should intervene with determined and clear messages to Israel. Erdogan made no secret of which side he was choosing in the conflict as he talked to Putin by phone on Wednesday about the escalating military showdown between Israel and the Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip, as reported by the Associated Press. Okay, here's, here's the, the money line right here. And then if anybody pays attention to Bible prophecy, your antenna should go up. The Turkish leader also pressed Putin on the need for a global force to protect the Palestinians. So here we have the leader of Turkey telling the leader of Russia, we need to form an international force and go make peace in Israel. Does this remind anybody of anything they might have stumbled across in the Bible sometime? Go to Ezekiel chapter 38. Once again, what? I'm not saying these things are coming to fruition just yet, but the mountains are approaching. They're definitely getting closer. And Ezekiel 38 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and this is the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. This is very confusing. Gog is the person. Magog is the land. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So he's the leader of these lands called Rosh. Meshach and Tubal, okay? Most scholars think that Rosh is Russia. I don't fully agree with that. But these other places that they mentioned, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him, these are regions in Turkey. And thus say the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O God, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Well, turn you around, I will put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. Gee, they're all satellites of Iran now at this time, too. Are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomar and all of its troops, and the house of Togarmah from the far north and its troops, 
and many people with you. So Gomer and Togarm are also regions of Turkey. So what the prophet is here is saying is sometime in the future, Turkey is going to lead an invasion of Israel. And here we just see this news story where the leader of Turkey, son, the leader of Russia, right? We need to do something. The world needs to do something. We need to intervene and stop this, what's going on in Israel. Mountains, we're getting closer. So let's drill down a little bit closer to Jerusalem. Let, let, let's, let's zoom in even closer. Go to Revelation chapter 11. More mountains here. Revelation chapter 11, starting in verse 1. And, and John is saying here, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Now, this is in the middle of the book of Revelation. So according to this, at some time in the future, there's going to be an altar, and worship is going to be going on in Jerusalem. And John is told to, to measure the area where this is happening. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. Hmm. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months or three and a half years, which most people say this is the, the, the back half of the, the seven-year tribulation period. But what I want us to see is by this point, there is worship going on in the temple area. And, and John is told to measure it. How can that be? How is that possible? There's, there's nothing there for them to worship with. Has anybody heard of the Temple Institute? The Temple Institute is this organization in Israel, in Jerusalem, that are preparing to reinstate worship under the law with animal sacrifices and the priests and the whole nine yards. Okay, the, this organization, they've already built all the vessels that are required to perform worship, you know, the, the, the menorah and, the, and the, the, the shovel and all that good stuff and the table for the showbread. They've already made the priestly garments. They've already trained a bunch of priests to don these holy garments and to perform their priestly duties. But what's even more staggering is, is I'm going to read this here from the Temple Institute. We are building a stone altar off-site. So, so they're building a stone altar that's mobile so that when the opportunity arrives, we can move it to its proper location on the mount. The divine service, including the offerings, can begin before building the temple itself. So what they're saying is we don't need the physical temple to start worshiping. We have this altar that we're building, and it's mobile, and just give the word, and we can go up there, and we can be starting today. The Temple Institute will wait for as long as it takes. The time for the building of the temple certainly isn't up to us. Okay, and he's going to mention something here about a red heifer. According to, to, to the law, right, the, 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 the nation is impure. And a perfect red heifer has to be sacrificed in order to make the nation pure. Well, they have a couple of red heifers that aren't quite all red. They have a few white hairs on them. They need to breed one that has no white hairs on it at all. And so that... A lot of people say, well, that's, that's, what hold, that's why this holding them up. They can't do it till they have the red heifer. Hold that thought. As for the ashes of the red heifer, while well, these are essential, the possibility of temporarily proceeding with the divine service at the Holy Temple when the majority of the nation of Israel is ritually impure, as is the case today, exists according to Torah. So the Temple Institute is saying, Torah tells us in extenuating circumstances that we have today, we can forego, at least temporarily, the need for the red heifer. So there is nothing standing in their way. If, if the government of Israel would say, go ahead, they could be up there this afternoon sacrificing animals in, in, in worshiping in the Old Testament manner. There's nothing preventing them except geopolitics. 
So he, he, the article goes, and in short, it is not technical issues that are holding up the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. As these can be worked out, what is needed is the will of the people of Israel and the nations to do what is necessary and build the house of God. I'm noticing here he doesn't say anything about the will of God in here, because, because if, you, if you study these things, that the temple that exists during Revelation is not ordained by God. Because as we're studying Zechariah in Sunday school, during the thousand year reign, God will create his own temple there, the third temple. But, but this temple we're talking about here is, its only purpose is for Antichrist to defile it. So once again, mountains getting awful close. Next sign that we're approaching that day. And to me, this one is huge. But I need to preface this with a crystal clear statement. Otherwise, I don't want to get run out of here on a rail. Okay? What I'm about to say, pay attention very carefully. I will speak slowly. <clears throat> okay? The coronavirus vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Okay? The coming coronavirus passports are not the mark of the beast, okay? But let's read, <clears throat> okay? Oh, so we're, we're clear, right, on what is not the mark of the beast, okay? Skip over to chapter 13 in Revelation. We want verses 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Oh, we could spend all day just on this passage, but that's for another day. And he ex exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, who is Antichrist, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fires come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. I mean, this guy's doing real things. I mean, this isn't fake. He's not... And he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Little tidbit, you know, I've studied Revelation a lot. And if, if you're ever reading Revelation on your own, and you see that term, those who dwell on the earth, it's used like 13 times in Revelation. It always invariably refers to non-believers. So we know who we're talking about here. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So they're instituting this, this law where you have to worship the Antichrist or you will die. Okay, now here we go. <clears throat> he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Okay, and so this mark, the, the, the Greek word is kragma, and it means to scratch or an etching. That is a stamp or a badge of servitude. So this is something that's visible, right, on your body, either your forehead or your right hand. And so what is this thing for then? And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what's this got to do with anything? Well, like I said, the, the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. The coming passports, and they are coming, are not the mark of the beast. But, but they are, in my mind, the final precursor to the actual mark of the beast. It is conditioning society, those who dwell on the earth, right, to accept such a thing. Because right now, it, it, is, it is going to be the COVID passports, and you'll need these to go maskless to certain places. And then they're going to start tightening the screws. And pretty soon, it's going to be, you're going to need your COVID passport to do virtually anything. Oh, Ron, you're just crazy talking. Am I? The Oregon Health Authority posted this statement. This is happening today. Businesses, employers, and faith institutions now have the option to adjust their masking guidance to allow fully vaccinated individuals 
to no longer wear a mask in their establishments. That's great. Okay, businesses, employers, and faith institutions doing so must have a policy in place to check the vaccination status of all individuals before they enter their establishment. So all businesses, all churches, you have to have a COVID certificate before you can enter the premises. Once it, that's not the mark, but it sure, sure looks like it though, right? So it is the precursor. We, it is conditioning us, right? Business, employers, and faith institutions who do not create such policies will maintain the same masking guidance listed below, regardless of an individual's vaccination status. So right now they're making it incumbent upon, you know, the, the, the businesses or the churches themselves to enforce this rule, okay? But it gets much worse. <clears throat> On March 8th, China launched its domestic vaccine passport which shows a Chinese citizen's vaccination status and virus test results via a program on Chinese social media platform WeChat. The following day on March 9th, China urged the World Health Organization to allow Beijing, I'm trusting it already, to build and run a global database for vaccine passports and legitimately prompting fears over privacy and expansion of government surveillance. The WeChat program and other Chinese smartphone apps include an encrypted QR code that allows authorities to obtain a traveler's health information. The app tracks a user's location and produces a color code of green, yellow, or red to indicate the likelihood of their having the virus and whether or not the person can walk around freely. These QR health codes are already required to gain entry to domestic transport and many other public spaces in China. So, so we have Oregon rolling out passports and other states are going to do it. Now, some states are saying we're never going to do it, right? And I, I don't believe any politician when he says never, right? And they might resist it, but so we have individual states doing it. it it'll, it'll be soon that the federal government will, will urge it or, or even mandate it. But the truly frightening thing is we have China pressuring the World Health Organization, which is in China's pocket. Anyway, oh, I'm starting to editorialize. Stop it. That they want to run this global registry. They want to run the global passport system to enforce it. Once again, it looks an awful lot like Revelation chapter 13 to me. Once again, it's not. That won't be the mark yet. Because the mark, remember I said it's a visible stamp in your wrist or your forehead. Well, there's this company back in 2004, I think it was, SoMark. They came up with this wonderful invention. It is an RFID ink tattoo. And it's used primarily in labs to keep track of the lab rats and also for cattle. It is this tattoo that they can apply and it contains information that can be read from a reader. So once again, now that will be, when they start wanting to stamp something on you, I hope that's your line in the sand that you're not gonna put this mark of any kind upon my person, right? Because the Bible tells us that the mark of the beast is a physical mark that can be seen, either on your wrist or for those who want to, you know, signal their, 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 their allegiance on their forehead. So the technology is there. We're in the foothills. The, the, it, it can happen anytime, right? We just. We just need the, 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 the man of sin to arise and all the tools are in place. All of the pieces are on the board. I don't know about you, but I see the day approaching and it's coming fast. So what should we do? What is the church's response if, if we see this is, is, is in the not too distant future? Well, there's a lot of wonderful one another verses in the Bible. And I'm going to read some of them. Because here in Hebrews, it says, don't forsake gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. And at the time Hebrews was written, you know, the persecution of the church was just starting. But these Hebrews, they had been feeling persecution from day one because their fellow countrymen hated them, right? And so, so they were in fear of their neighbors. And yet they're commanded, don't forsake meeting together, right? 
Not just because God's mean and he wants people to pick on you. It's because it's necessary. It is necessary. Let's look at some of these verses about one another. And I'm just going to read through them. You don't have to look them up. John 13, 35. By this, all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Galatians 6, 12. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love one another, right? Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. This, this passage really speaks to me, especially in today's world. I mean, the world is cruel. I mean, you go to work and you deal with not nice people all day long. You deal with traffic and it's hideous. I want to go someplace where people are kind. Where I know the people are going to be kind and gentle and forgiving and say, Ron, yeah, I know you had a bad week. Come on in and let's love each other. I mean, this cannot be replaced by anything. Any, any drug, anything can, can replace this feeling you get when, when you are welcomed and loved. <laughs> Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's something about being in a group of people praising the Lord together. I don't know about you. I mean, Zoom's a wonderful technology. Don't get me wrong. But I am not uplifted hearing my own voice croaking, the only one in the room, right, looking at a screen. I need cover. And, and so, so it helps me to worship Right? When, when there's other voices being lifted up and, and mine is not prominent. And so, and that also cannot be replaced. It, th there's nothing like it. James 15, 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed and the effective and fervent, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And here in 1 Peter 4, 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. <clears throat> So in conclusion, Barb and I recently were on vacation in Kentucky, and it was always wonderful. We rented a house down there in the hills, and it was so nice just to get away from the pressures of the world and, and, and just, oh. well, this property, they had horses there. And these two horses, unfortunately can't see them very well because the projector, but our buddies are Stormy's in the stall, and Blackjack is there next to her. Well, earlier that day, the farrier had come and, and worked on Stormy's hooves. And for some reason, I don't know why, we, we, we never had, she had to be confined from the other horses. And you could tell she wasn't happy. Because, you know, they're used to being together all the time. So, so what does Blackjack do? Instead of going out in the pasture with his other buddies and, and living it up and eating like everything's normal, Blackjack goes into the stall and he stood like that all day and he didn't do anything he was just there and to me that is what i've been lacking this last year and a half a smile a touch a hug a handshake or just someone's physical presence Right? You don't have to say or do anything. Just being there sometimes is all that is needed. And that, and I'm not blaming anyone, or I could, but I won't, has been taken away from us for the last year and a half. And yes, there's many good arguments why people should stay away and, and all this stuff, but I'm not going to argue the reasons. I'm just going to tell you the result is it's been hurtful and damaging to the body, right? To all of us. And thank God, right, the restrictions will soon be eased that we can see each other's faces again. We can, we can sit next to each other again. And, and all of those normal activities that, to me, make up being in the church. 
And so in closing, the day is approaching. Okay, I am not a prophet, right? If I ever claim to be one, stone me now, right? But I am a student of history. I am an avid observer of geopolitics. You don't have to be a prophet to know that hard times are coming. Persecution of the church in the West is going to arise. See, we in the West, especially America, we've been blessed, but no, it's a curse. In my mind, we have been pampered. We have not had, as a body, as, as the church universal in the West, we have, we have not had any hard times whatsoever. There's been no persecution. And because of that, and I'm lumping myself in there with it, we have become soft and even worse, independent. I don't need this. It's nice, right? But when persecution comes, and once again, I'm not a prophet, just my observations, it's coming. It's already happening in Canada. When the church starts getting persecuted, we are going to need one another because that's all we're going to have. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, wait. He reminded me. <clears throat> As a result of this persecution, there's going to be a separating from those who truly believe and those who are Christian in name only. So the question is, well, how do I know I am a Christian and not one in name only? Well, what is, what is the gospel that Paul tell us, right? If you believe, right, that Christ died for your sins, and we're not talking about acknowledging a historical fact. Believe means to have faith in, place your trust in the fact that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. If you believe that, if you place all of your hope and your trust in that, and only that, you're part of the church. You are a Christian, you are saved, and you're going to be saved from the coming day of the Lord. But if you're not, if you've, if you've just walked down the aisle and, and said a prayer and invited Jesus into your heart, I, I'm not fond of that term, that means nothing. Unless you are trusting God, for your salvation, Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, your name only. So come aboard, place your trust in Christ, and join us. Now let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to present your word. And Lord, I, I pray that I'm wrong about the coming persecution, but I don't think that I am. And, and Lord, help us to prepare for that and help us to be this congregation of one another's, that we are here for one another, that we embrace and lift up one another. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.